pre-gavel. I first want to thank my colleagues for their leadership and their guidance during these incredibly challenging times. I'd also like to acknowledge the community members who are taking time to join us in council today. Thank you for being here. We're here this morning to share in a moment of reflection to honor the victims of those whose lives were taken by acts of gun violence in 2020 and 2021. Gun violence as you know, has been on the rise in our city since December of 2019. We're seeing more shootings than we have in decades. In January of 2021 alone, there have been close to 100 shootings and six deaths. When we hear these statistics, it's easy to view them only as numbers, but it's important to remember that each number represents a child, a parent, a friend, or a neighbor whose life was taken too soon. Today, we want to honor them and their legacies. We want to hold them in our thoughts. We must use their stories to inspire our ongoing work to address and prevent future gun violence. Gun violence is a public health issue, and it's essential to diagnose and treat the problem just like we would a virus. All of us agree the time for action is now. The Office of Violence Prevention has made a video that honors each person whose life was taken by gun violence in Portland in 20, 2020 and 2021. My colleagues will then have some remarks to share after. Keelan, can you please play the video for us?
Thank you. And I'd like to thank Nike Green in the Office of Violence Prevention for putting that together. Colleagues? Um, Mr. Mayor? Commissioner Maps. Uh, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the Office of Violence Prevention for that powerful presentation. Um, I have served on this council for 34 days. And in that time, Portland has seen 108 shootings and eight homicides, including guns. Um, if we go back one year to January 2020, Portland had just 51 shootings and only one person died from gun violence. Um, on this issue, my heart and my head say that uh, uh, we must, this must change. Uh, the rise of gun violence is unacceptable. Um, I believe that we must come together as a council and as a community to end the violence. Um, I wanna reassure the public that this is an issue that my colleagues and I work on every day. Um, here are some examples of some of the things that um, I'm doing in my capacity as uh, your representative on city council. Uh, first, as the commissioner for the Bureau of Emergency Communications, I'm working with my staff to look at how we prioritize 911 calls. Um, our goal here is to make sure that we are getting uh, um, the proper response to gun violence as soon as possible. Uh, second, also in my capacity as the BOAT commissioner, uh, we are working with the mayor's office and with the police bureau to see what we can do to speed up police response times to calls that involve gun violence. Um, third, as your city commissioner, I pledge to support gun violence prevention programs. Uh, fourth, I also pledge to support violence interruption programs like those sponsored by the Office of Violence Prevention. And fifth, um, I pledge to embrace the practice and the politics of peace. Violence is a disease as contagious as any virus. The only way to break the cycle of violence is to embrace the politics of peace. Um, so let me conclude this morning by asking every Portlander to join me in rejecting violence and choosing peace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That's the end of my comment. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, uh, you're up next, and then Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Rubio put her hand up first. I was just so still in the moment of the video that I had not responded. So I'll go after Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, and first of all, I want to take a moment, um, like my colleagues, to appreciate um, this time and also the Office of, of Violence Prevention, uh, their team, for lifting up this moment to honor these individuals who lost their lives to gun violence. Um, these losses are felt uniquely painfully here today. And it's also a very terrible reality that right now this is um, an epidemic and it's, it's uh, plaguing communities around the country. Um, and every uh, single demographic has felt the sting of violence, uh, but especially in our young people, which is absolutely breaking my heart. And I know it breaks everybody's heart um, when we learn this. And in my work at a youth serving nonprofit, over and over again, we witnessed this violence that was disproportionately happening in our BIPOC communities among young people. And the damage that it leaves is absolutely devastating to families, to the whole community network that, that was touched by these lives, um, that this person is connected to in school and work and life um, and in community. And that's why the work of these agencies and partnerships with city and county are so very important because they prevent violence in order to save lives and also have been doing so for decades in some cases. So we need to listen to community. We need to listen to them. And as well, we need to listen to impacted families to tell us what's working and to tell us where we can do more or what we can do differently. Um, it, and in honor of these victims, we as a council, um, and I heard Commissioner Mouse say this too, that you know we need to recommit ourselves to doing the hard work in our communities to get to these root causes of violence and focus on community-centered solutions. And so now's the time for all of us to double down in our work with trusted leaders and with communities that are impacted 
and organizations who are in this work for real to make our communities safer for children and families, but especially for frontline communities who are bearing the brunt of this violence. Um, just yesterday, we engaged in a work session where we talked about all these upstream interventions in a culturally responsive way um, so that we're catching these situations before they escalate to violence. But underneath it all, we need a foundation of trust with community and we need building to build meaningful partnerships based on that trust and mutual respect. We owe it to the faces that we just witnessed um, to do the hard work to make this a reality and that deep recommitment to community and doing all it takes to build a safe and thriving Portland is a tribute that I hope that we can make to these victims in uh, today and in the coming months. So thank you for the opportunity, Mayor, to say something. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, for um, this pre-gavel moment. And thank you, Nike Green and your team at the Office of Violence Prevention. That was that was powerful. I, um, I was really slow to raise my hand because I was kind of numb. So thank you for leveling us. We, need, we needed that. Uh, my heart is with the families in our city who have lost loved ones to gun violence. The spike in gun deaths that we are collectively witnessing is nothing short of an absolute tragedy. Gun violence is complex and it's deeply rooted in inequitable systems that exist in our culture. This is a public health crisis and addressing this very real safety concern in our city requires a renewed emphasis and commitment to find ways to address this crisis. As a council, we have that obligation to work together to prioritize solutions. And this is definitely one of them. That means building and strengthening upstream supports working directly with the communities that impacted, that are impacted and using data, and I never forget there are people behind the data to ensure that we're successful. I look forward to working with my colleagues, especially my colleagues in charge of emergency response bureaus to offer whatever support I can on this issue. And again, my heart goes out to those of you who've lost loved ones in this growing epidemic. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan and Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Nike Green, for uh, a very powerful uh, video representation. Um, I also want to speak directly to the families because, unfortunately, I've spent a lot of time comforting moms and family members who have lost lo loved ones uh, to gun violence. Um, and it is a devastating loss of potential and opportunity for so many of our community members. Um, I am pleased to say that as a council, we are collectively uh, addressing this A, as a public health issue, not trying to find simple solutions to very complex problems, being open to innovation, uh, like talking to the people most impacted by policing, black men between 14 and 44, making sure that they are part of what we build to make sure that we're reducing gun violence in Portland. We also know since the pandemic began in March, we've seen over 150% increase in domestic violence. We know that uh, many of the deaths that we saw um, in the video uh, can be tied directly to domestic violence related issues. What we know is that we have people who are desperate, who've had no income and have no hope. It is our job as the council to provide that hope for these families who've been devastated, for a community who has to see us collectively setting a vision for where we're headed. And then for us and our own individual bureaus to figure out collectively, how do we make sure that we're building the safety net that hasn't existed for decades? Um, we have a lot of work to do. I look forward to continuing to partner with the Office of Violence Prevention to see how we can collaborate both with the county and their outreach workers and frontline community-based organizations 
who have those deep relationships. I think a missing piece is also those coming back from incarceration because we send people back with nothing and somehow expect them to uh, fully function with housing and employment and et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mayor, um, it was funny to find out that you and I had the same vision about um, uh, honoring uh, these people who left our community too soon at the hands of gun violence. And I appreciate uh, your collaborative approach to allowing all of us to um, honor these families and make the commitment that their deaths will not be in vain. What we build coming out of this pandemic will honor where we're moving as a city. So I thank you for your partnership on this. I'm grateful to all my colleagues and the, uh, how collectively we all share both the devastation and the obligation to do better. We know what doesn't work, so now we have the chance to figure out what does work and do it together. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty, and thank you, colleagues. Appreciate it. And again, uh, Director Green, thank you for putting this together for all of us. So colleagues, we are now in session. This is the February 3rd, 2021 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio? Here. Ryan? Here. Hardesty? Here. Maps? Here. Wheeler? Here. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the council are attending remotely by video and teleconference and the city has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the city's YouTube channel, eGovPEX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to the council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and to promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your continued patience, understanding, and flexibility as we work to manage through these difficult times to conduct the city's business. With that, we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov slash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or ejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Finally, please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. Thanks, Robert. First up is communications. Keelan, if you could read the first individual's name, please, item 63. Request of Sarah Hobbs to address council regarding need for broader discussion concerning suicide. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, for the record, my name is Sarah Hobbs. I am a field advocate with the Oregon State Chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I am on the Oregon Health Authority's Adult Suicide Prevention Task Force. 
In my now ongoing eight years of working in suicide prevention, I have found the continued silence on the part of members of city council to be deafening. One elected official once told me it was not the city's problem to address, but the county's. Portland is the largest city in the county. It is our issue as well. What I need from you is to admit we have a problem. My work on the task force is to speak for those affected by suicide, whether through lived experience or those who are affected by it due to their work. I am not coming just to demand something out of you, but to offer something as well. I will work hard to address your concerns. I cannot do this if you do not first acknowledge the problem, then to talk to me. I will be in touch with your offices. I look forward to working with you as I strive to be a voice in bringing suicide out into the light and in doing so, save fellow Portlanders lives. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. And I want to assure you that all of us on the city council take suicide and behavioral health extremely seriously. Um, this is obviously a timely situation as we know that during the COVID crisis, more people are seeking treatment. And that is ex exactly the same time as I know you're aware that our service providers are struggling to stay in business. In fact, there's an article in this morning's Willamette Week about Cascadia Behavioral Healthcare. It is our state's largest provider of mental health treatment. And it is in fact uh, the largest contractor in the Portland area and it is in financial difficulties. That caught my attention because one of the first things that happened after I was elected Multnomah County Chair back in 2007 was that Cascadia Behavioral Health Care was forced to close its doors due to financial difficulties. And that left a lot of people in dire straits. And at that time, the county and Cascadia and many other community uh, organizations came together to restore those efforts. And I really applaud the great progress that Cascadia made over those years. And it saddens me to see that they are again in financial difficulties at a time when so many people in the community are desperate for the services they provide. Uh, I want to applaud you personally, Sarah, for coming forward and having the courage to highlight this issue. And I want you to know that uh, we support your efforts in this case. And I, I know that my colleagues all feel the same way. So thank you for stepping forward today. Keelan, the next individual, please, item 64. Okay. Request of Marianne Fitzgerald to address council regarding Southwest neighborhoods need fiscal support. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners Hardesty, Maps, Brian, and Rubio, thank you for the opportunity today to talk with you. My name is Mary Ann Fitzgerald, and for many years I have served in leadership roles in my local neighborhood association and district coalition, but my comments today are my personal comments on issues in my neighborhood. The Office of Community and Civic Life administers City Code 3.96 that is designed to encourage people in Portland to participate in civic affairs. This geographically based structure has served people well by turning a big city into seven small towns and 95 neighborhoods that can effectively and efficiently respond to local needs. Last July, the Portland City Council deferred funding the Southwest Neighborhood Inc's coalition known by the acronym SWENI or SWNI. Sadly, over the past year, there has not been much dialogue about between city civic life and the people in Southwest Portland about issues raised by a few people. Now, seven months later, Sweeney has depleted what funds it had and laid off most of its staff. These layoffs mean Southwest neighborhoods now rely on volunteers' time and energy to provide minimal services to the people in Southwest Portland in a not very effective and not very efficient way. Southwest neighborhoods need fiscal support for people who need the neighborly help right now during this COVID-19 pandemic. 
Southwest neighborhoods are at risk of losing access to online meeting tools, websites, and newsletters that keep people in touch with each other and informed of local issues and local resources. Southwest neighborhoods are at risk of losing fiscal sponsorships and the insurance needed to conduct work parties and many community building events. District coalitions like Sweeney have organized to help people locally meet the city's priorities. Sweeney has standing committees that take action to meet the city's climate action and equity goals and to maintain and enhance public safety, land use and transportation planning, schools, parks, watersheds, and other neighborhood needs. It's challenging to carry out this work when we face losing the tools we depend on to communicate and collaborate. Southwest neighborhoods can transform to meet the current city priorities, but it will take time and resources. It's urgent that you fund Sweeney for this fiscal year, just five months left in this fiscal year, as soon as possible. These funds are already in Civic Life's budget. These funds would give the people in Southwest Portland time to build relationships with Commissioner Hardesty, with Civic Life, and with other partners in our community and transform this organization to meet both local and citywide needs. Thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you for your, uh, being here today. Next up are our first time certain items. Keelan, can you please read items 65 and 66 together? Declare intent to initiate local improvement district formation proceedings to construct street, sidewalk, and stormwater improvements in the Errol Heights local improvement district and authorize the Bureau of Transportation to acquire certain temporary rights necessary for construction of the Errol Heights Street and local improvement district through the exercise of the city's eminent domain authority. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, the uh, uh, I'm sorry. Did Keelan read the uh, the uh, numbers that we're uh, on? Yeah, sixty-five and sixty-six. Uh, and sixty-six. Thank you. Uh, my my apologies. Um, I would like to introduce agenda items sixty-five and sixty-six. Uh, 65 declares the intent for the local improvement district formation proceedings to construct street, sidewalk, and stormwater improvements for Earl Heights local improvement district. And 6-6 um, six, six authorizes the Bureau of Transportation to acquire certain temporary property rights. I am going to turn this over uh, to uh, the esteemed staff at PBOT and BES project managers uh, to present a presentation. Elizabeth, Great, is thank not with you? Yes, hi, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you very much for that introduction. And good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. Um, for the record, Elizabeth Chilstrom, Project Manager with the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And I'm joined today by my counterpart in BES, um, Sean Bistoff, uh, Project Manager for Errol Heights um, on the Bureau of Environmental, Environmental Services side. Um, we're also joined by um, uh, Ning, Zhang, um, who has helped with um, public involvement on the project from BES, and then George Lazavoy from the Portland Parks, um, Portland Parks and Recreation. Um, oh, and finally, excuse me, um, Marty Maloney, my colleague in PBOT, that will discuss um, agenda item 66 with regards to the um, temporary construction easements. Um, so we thought we'd talk a little bit about the project, provide some background, and then dig into the specifics of the local improvement district petition process, which is why we're here today. Um, and then if it's okay with you, I will share my screen here. And let me know when you can see it. We see it, Elizabeth. Great, okay, thank you so much. So the Errol Heights neighborhood is technically within the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association, um, but before it was annexed into the city in 1986, this area was um, known as Errol Heights. And our project area sits between Southeast 45th and Southeast 52nd Avenues, and then Southeast Malden Drive to the north and Southeast Tenino Court to the south. So the, the um, map in front of you shows all of the streets that will be involved in this street improvement project, all of those blue lines you see. 
This area um, is adjacent to the Errol Heights Park, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's another exciting project moving forward. And this area sits just north of Johnson Creek. The existing conditions um, for Errol, 88% um, of the streets uh, within this neighborhood are unimproved gravel streets. These are images of um, all of the streets that will be involved in our capital project. Um, and apologies to the Errol Heights property owners that we have joining us here today. These images make these roads look pretty tame. They were taken on a nice dry sunny day. So they just look like evenly gravel, evenly graded um, gravel roads, country roads. Um, but, um, you know, come winter or, you know, um, some of the, the wetter seasons we have, um, this is what the roads, um, this is a more accurate depiction. Um, they become heavily rutted. Some sections of this neighborhood become impassable. Um, and over the years, the neighbors have taken it upon themselves to um, fill in some of those depressions and gaps and potholes um, throughout the neighborhood so that, um, uh, you know, motor vehicles, small motor vehicles, um, as well as delivery trucks, mail service, emergency response um, can make it through their neighborhood. Not quickly, but at least it's passable. Um, so that's what the roads look like uh, currently in Errol. Um, this is a project 12 years in the making. We have been working on um, this project to improve the roads in Errol since 2008. Um, there have been two previous LID efforts um, the, the previous efforts never made it to the petition process, but we had started the conversations with the community. Both of those efforts in 2008 and 2014 were unsuccessful due to the high cost um, that would have been borne by property owners at that time. In 2008, we only, PBOT only had our current um, full street standard for improving roads. Um, and the assessment would have been $80,000 for an average 5,000 square foot lot. In 2014, when PBOT had um, released its um, shared street design, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, the price tag was a lot lower, but it would have been 100% funded by property owners. And at, at that time, um, a 5,000 square foot, for a four or 5,000 square foot lot, the assessment would have been 12,000, uh, no, excuse me, 25,000. So still proved cost prohibitive. Um, and the community was really concerned about, with the traditional LID, and payments um, needing to be made immediately following construction that we would, um, that there was a risk of displacing um, individuals on fixed or low income in their community. And so um, neither of those efforts moved forward. So in 2015, we had a recalibration. Everyone was still committed in trying to move this forward, but the city needed to go back to the drawing board and figure out how we could make that happen. Um, so then in between the years of 2016, 2020, working with the community, we identified um, uh, funding to help offset the costs of this LID, um, refined our designs um, to help true up um, our engineers' estimates, get costs down as much as possible. And I'm really proud to say that here we are now in 2021, um, the design has finally been completed. We received the final plans from the consultant yesterday. Um, and we are just checking off these final pieces, these milestones um, before going to construction this summer. So when we came back um, to the table with the community in two, 2016, following that recalibration, we developed these project goals and objectives. Um, we wanted to improve access for pedestrians, bicycles, cars, and emergency vehicles. We wanted to um, improve access to schools, parks, and community centers. We really wanted to address the safety and livability issues um, that existed in Errol, um, as well as stormwater conveyance and water quality. And, and Sean will talk about that in a moment, but one of the big issues throughout this um, neighborhood is with the unimproved roadways and the topography, many property owners were experiencing basement flooding and were being severely impacted by the unimproved roads. Um, our goal is to maintain low traffic volumes and speeds. Um, Errol Heights is a really special character. It's, it's close in in the city, um, but it feels like a very different place. Um, and so the goal was to um, continue to keep um, traffic low throughout this area, as well as speeds once those roads are paved, um, and maintain the character um, and feel of the neighborhood. Um, we were committed to providing a, a low cost um, street design and also committed 
um, as, as um, city staff to um, look for as many funding opportunities as we could to really offset the cost to property owners. So I've talked about or mentioned sh shared streets, um, wanted to provide information on what that is. So the definition of shared streets means that everyone can use that space equally. Pedestrians, cyclists, motor vehicles. Um, we may have to amend um, our sign for Errol. They have a really special family of 16 peacocks that also um, roam the streets. And so um, the definition of shared streets is really gonna be expanded for Errol. Um, but, uh, PBOT's design standard can only be applied, this shared street standard can only be applied to residential streets. They um, must carry less than 500 vehicles per day. Um, if we are building a shared street, we have to lower the speed limit to 15 miles per hour and post those at the entry points to shared streets um, and then include um, this shared street signage so that the messaging is really clear of um, how, how this road operates. So here's a rendering of what those shared streets are gonna look like in Errol. Um, all of the north-south streets um, in Errol will be shared streets. Um, it's a narrow 16 to 18 foot um, center strip paving. Um, adjacent to that will be gravel parking shoulders. Um, next to those parking shoulders working out are the stormwater um, conveyance facilities. And then between the facilities and private property is a transition zone where still in the public right of way, but we'll be planting um, over 100 trees throughout the neighborhood to further help with stormwater management and air quality. Um, so we have the shared streets on the majority of streets in Errol, but the main streets into and out of the neighborhood will actually be um, separated, what we call separated streets, meaning we're gonna pull pedestrians out of that roadway and um, construct sidewalk. And the reason being is when we were working on the design and um, we did the traffic modeling, by improving these roads, the model indicate, indicated that there could be some additional traffic assigned to these streets. And so we wanna ensure um, that pedestrians um, are safe um, with the risk of you know, the volumes exceeding the criteria for shared streets. So in addition, so we'll, so we'll be building sidewalk. And then in addition to that, we'll be applying additional traffic calming measures to meet that goal of keeping um, vehicle volumes low and speeds low. So for Southeast Malden and Southeast Tonino Drive and Court, um, we will be building them as chicaned um, or curvilinear roads. Um, and they will also have speed bumps on them. So it won't be a straight cut through between 45th and 52nd. Um, and we really think that'll, that'll help meet the goals, um, those two stated goals of low volumes and speeds. So that, um, those are the specifics of the transportation elements. At this point, I am gonna turn it over to Sean Bistoff to talk about the specifics of the stormwater design. Okay, thank you, Liz. So the excuse, stormwater me, Sean. excuse me, Sean, before you start, sure. uh, I was still a bit discombobulated when I presented this. And so I didn't take the opportunity to talk about what an incredible partnership this is with city bureaus, really thinking outside of the box about how we invest uh, some uh, very small resources into communities that um, have not had access to, shall I say it, sidewalks and um, a, a good street improvements. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge uh, that uh, having PBOT and BES work in partnership about how do we how do we do this once, right? And how do we do it in a way that's really building the kind of city we want to live in? I wanted to take the opportunity to also say that um, it says a lot when you've been working on a project like this for so long that uh, you have over eighty percent of community approval about. Uh, the design and direction that this project is going. I know we have some neighbors who will speak later um, about how they've been involved in this process, but um, I did not want to do a disservice to either PBOT or BES uh, for this incredible effort that you've taken on in a community that has lacked sidewalks and infrastructure for so long. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about this project from a personal level because uh, you are in my naked woods and uh, I appreciate the fact that this collaboration is happening and that you've brought the community along with it. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, Sean, feel free to take it away. Elizabeth, great job. 
uh, but I was still discombobulated from the film we watched as we uh, convened this morning. Uh, it's kind of hard to uh, set that aside. So thank you so much for the great work that you're doing. Please continue. John. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, and I agree, it was, it's, it's been tough to reorient after that film. So, um, and you touched upon something that I'll, I'll get to in a couple slides, which is the community impact. And also I'd like to mention that Portland Parks and Recreation has no small part in the efforts in this neighborhood as well, which I, I will segue into. Um, so the Arrow Heights stormwater design is fairly unique. Um, the initial concept was for surface infiltration with vegetated planters and green streets. Uh, as we moved into the geotechnical and stormwater analysis, we realized that um, the geology of the site, the steep slopes, the soil type limit that surface infiltration. Um, and it moved us into looking at deep infiltration with sumps. Um, and that was feasible. So our current design is a hybrid approach of um, conveyance ditches that you can see uh, in the image on the right that, that convey water to sedimentation manholes, which provide pretreatment prior to moving to the sumps, which provide that deep groundwater infiltration. Uh, where sumps aren't feasible, we have two large vegetated stormwater facilities that will be aesthetically very pleasing to the neighborhood and, and will be, be visible the lower reaches of the, the project area. In terms of maintenance, the city will be maintaining uh, the project and property owners are being encouraged to help care for maintenance of uh, the conveyance ditches on their frontages by removing trash and weeds and so forth. And I should say that the Arrow Heights stormwater design isn't just critical for the LID area itself, but for Johnson Creek, which is the immediate receiving water body just downstream of this steeply sloping area. Uh, next slide, Liz. So um, the Arrow Heights, runoff from the Arrow Heights in the current situation flows directly to Johnson Creek. And these slides are, uh, Two of these slides are taken during storm conditions. Um, so you can see that, you know, there's a lot of erosion that moves downslope from Arrow Heights to an outfall to Johnson Creek, which is that uh, the upper right photo shows both the creek and the outfall. Um, with that sediment comes a lot of the known urban contaminants that we see in stormwater, oil and grease. Um, sediment itself is not good for uh, fish and there's often metals and so forth uh, transported with urban stormwater. Um, the other notable thing about this outfall is that it's in the middle of a larger BES uh, restoration project to restore Johnson Creek. And the Arrow Heights project will help address um, the sediment coming out of this outfall. Uh, next slide, please, Liz. So I'd like to touch just briefly on the Johnson Creek Oxbow project, which as I mentioned, is at the downstream end of the Errol Heights stormwater system. And it is a water quality and habitat restoration project. And a couple, uh, there's a couple images here of the creek within the Oxbow area. Um, it will provide habitat for endangered salmon and other native species. And Errol Heights LID will eliminate a source of pollution to Johnson Creek within that Oxbow project area. It's, it's another project that I'm managing and it makes, it makes the Oxbow project so much better and so much easier to work with when we know that that source of contamination is being dealt with by the upstream Errol Heights LID project. And in combination with um, the Errol Heights Park, the Oxbow project will provide improved community access to to natural areas. And um, the next slide we'll talk about Errol Heights Park, but I really see the Oxbow project, the Errol Heights Park project, and the Errol Heights LID project as three parts of a whole that are really going to improve um, livability in the neighborhood, access to natural areas, and just um, really help, help improve the neighborhood overall. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, so we wanted to be sure to include just a bit of information on the Errol Heights project that is currently in design and will also go to construction this summer. Um, it is going to be a mix of um, improvements and, and restoration for the lower part of the park um, where there's the natural area and, and wetland and riparian areas. And then um, at the top, the, the plateau of the park 
um, will serve um, as an area for play, picnics, and gardening for um, Errol Heights and the surrounding Brentwood Darlington community. Um, and we wanted to just quickly show some information about our public involvement summary. There's, there's been a lot over the 12 years, um, but for this latest effort, um, we had multiple public open houses. We held a design workshop um, on a Saturday in the neighborhood. Um, we held um, multiple um, drop-in, what we kind of call design office hours, where we set up a tent. It's one, the picture in the top right is of one of those sessions where property owners could drop in and look at the, the design on their street or right in, immediately in front of their property um, and discuss with the um, engineering team and, and make adjustments as needed. Um, since there is, this, there is an LID component and property owners are paying for this, we wanted to make sure that the design um, not only worked for PBOT and BES, but, but for property owners and the way they're using their community and, and their property. So. Um, we held those, those office hours. We had individual property owner meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, um, directly in front of their properties. We also had multiple briefings with the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association. And then of course, sent out mailers, newsletters, email updates as we worked through the design milestones, um, and then notifications and, and posters placed throughout the neighborhood. And, th and that was specific to the LID petition process. We wanted to make sure everyone knew and was made aware that, that was happening in case they missed it in the mail. Um, so a bit about um, the local improvement district um, for Errol. It is um, different than our traditional LID. Um, we have capped the assessment for property owners at $2.55 per square foot. So for an average 5,000 square foot lot, um, the assessment would be 12,750. Um, the average assessment um, in Errol um, since there's a range of lot sizes is $14,137.58. And the, the map to the right, um, those blue um, parcels, those are all of the properties that will be involved in the LID, um, totaling 116 properties total. Um, one of the reasons we were really successful with the um, LID discussion this time around was not only that we had um, uh, identified public funding to, to further reduce the cost of the LID, but that we are offering a full deferral until such times as a property is sold. So immediately following construction, we will file the assessments with the county, a lien will be placed against the property, but then property owners do not need to do anything um, until, you know, if and when they sell their property. And so in the interim, PBOT will be paying um, for this, the cost of the LID, up front with transportation SDC costs. Um, and um, when we um, set out on this latest LID petition effort, um, well, first I should say city council's requirement um, for LIDs is that uh, we receive greater than 50% support before we bring this forward to council for consideration. Um, our specific project goal for Errol Heights was that we receive over 50% 50, 50 support independent of waivers. So the map to the right, all of those yellow parcels you see, those are properties that have waivers of remonstrance on file with the city. And what that means is that over the years as development has occurred, um, the city allowed um, developers to forego their required frontage improvements since it didn't make sense for them to build just a little segment in front of their property. Um, however, in doing so, we made them sign a waiver of remonstrance that um, stated if and when the city were to move forward with an LID to improve the roads, that they could not protest against the project, that they were kind of an automatic vote or yes for that LID. So you can see there's a significant number of waivers in this um, community. And the concern was um, from some property owners that PBOT would take the amount, the, the high number of those waivers, add in the property owners that were supportive, and there we would have over 50% and move forward with it. So our goal was to gain majority of community support without relying on those waivers. And so, um, what uh, the actual support we received, we're really proud, is that independent of waiver status um, for Errol Heights, we received 56 or almost 57% support um, for this LID. And then when you factor in those waivers, 
um, we're closer to 68%. And I want to flag that this doesn't mean that um, there's 32% um, not, not supportive of the project. Um, instead, most likely what happens is property owners just, just don't respond. Um, and when we bring the actual LID formation ordinance to council in March, it'll be at that point where any dissent or waivers of remonstrance that we receive or any protests will be presented at that time. And here's a funding breakdown of the LID and um, total project. So we have a nine, currently have a $9.3 million project. This value is inclusive of all of the phases. So planning, design, right-of-way, construction. Um, the LID um, amounts to almost, or excuse me, 1.6 1, 1. Um, million um, or 18% of the total project value. And then um, we have a, um, uh, a number of other public funding sources that are being applied. So years ago, um, some general fund up out of the mud um, program money was allocated to Errol. Um, we have transportation um, system development charges um, assigned to the project. And then the Bureau of Environmental Services and Portland Parks and Re Recreation um, have funding um, assigned to the project as well through their capital improvement programs. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Marty Maloney, um, the right-of-way agent for PBOT, to talk about um, briefly agenda item 66, which are the temporary construction easements for Errol Heights. Good morning, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, my name is Marty Maloney with the PBOT right-of-way. Uh, agenda item 66 gives PBOT the authority to compensate affected property owners for needed temporary easements, and if necessary, to condemn uh, for these property rights associated with the Errol Heights LID project. Um, permanent right away is not necessary. Only temporary rights will be needed for four properties to support construction of project improvements. Uh, these temporary easements will allow construction support of certain ADA and sidewalk facilities uh, being placed within existing right of way. Um, all affected property owners have been informed of the project and um, the need for these temporary property rights and we're all invited to uh, attend the reading uh, today. Um, at this point, I'll turn it back to Liz um, for, uh, to continue the presentation. Great, thank you, Marty. Okay, um, so wanted to share information on our schedule and next steps. Here we are today, um, this city council session with the resolution identifying our intent to form the LID and begin um, the, the formal proceedings. Um, from now until the first week of March, we'll be um, moving forward with the required public notifications outlined in city code. And then sometime in March, following um, the required timelines for those notifications, we'll, we'll come back before council um, and present in, um, on the, the official formation ordinance. Um, at the same time, concurrent with these efforts, we are obtaining final permits um, required for construction. Um, and then our intent is to wrap all of that up, advertise the project for construction in April, and then break ground um, this summer in July. Um, and then finally, um, uh, wanted to um, acknowledge, at, you know, as a 12-year project, um, many people have touched this over the years and, and worked um, tirelessly to help um, really get us to where we are today. So Sean and I are, are lucky to be the ones presenting here, but we wanted to take a moment and just acknowledge all of the past and present um, leadership and staff from BES, PBOT, Portland Parks and Recreation, and probably some other bureaus that have touched this, touched this and other organizations that I haven't listed here, um, but, but wanted to acknowledge um, everyone, as well as the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association that have been champions for this project over the years. Um, there are a number of gravel streets throughout Brentwood Tarlington, so they're very interested in, in seeing this approved or seeing Errol Heights move forward and then hoping that it can be a model for the rest of the streets in their neighborhood. And then last but last, last but not least, um, the Errol Heights community, the property owners and residents within this really special community that have um, worked really hard over the years to, to keep this moving forward. Um, 
And so to that end, we've invited testimony from three of those property owners in Errol that over the years, they've been longstanding project champions internally in the community, um, working with their neighbor, neighbors to bring them along, but also um, with the city, keeping us on task and helping us develop the best design possible for Errol. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to them and, and call up um, Molly Stiles first for testimony. Is it on? Okay. Hi. Um, I my name is Molly Stiles. I am not a lobbyist. Um, I have been living here on 52nd since 2012, and I strongly would love to have this road put in. So um, my biggest concern used to be that every time we get a heavy rain in Portland, our basement floods. Um, the most recent one was just a couple weeks ago. I recently just had a baby, so I had an infant and around one o'clock in the morning, I asked my husband where he was and he was in the basement siphoning out water from our basement. He um, thinks maybe it was about 150 gallons that night. And then we spent about $300 um, in fans and dehumidifiers drying out our basement yet again the next week and that's happened about six to seven times since we've lived here since 2012. Um, the other thing that's really important to me is that a we have this part going in and that's happening no matter what no matter if this road goes in or not but I have three small children and you know the roads get these gigantic potholes in them and so when you're on the gravel road and you're taking a walk it's really, really unpredictable to know what direction the cars are going to take because they're either going to be generous and drive through these potholes so that you don't have to move or they're going to swerve around the potholes and then you have to decide whether or not you have to move or the car is going to move. And it's very unsafe, especially when you have a stroller and you have a child on a bike. It's just very nerve wracking and unpredictable to determine what direction these cars are going to take. And it's throughout the entire neighborhood. So. Uh, yeah, I am super excited to see this get passed. I am all for having the community help pay for it. I don't even care how much it costs. I just want this done as efficiently and as soon as possible. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for, for <laughs> it's, it's awesome to see the uh, multitasking going on there. That's great. Yes, uh, Molly, you wanna introduce your daughter? Um, this is Maisie. Hi, she's welcome. in uh, kindergarten this year, and um, that's yet another thing as well. That you know, the school is very close and within walking distance. So having safe roads to walk the kids to school every day is something that's really important to us. She's a cutie. Take her everywhere. We'll do whatever, whatever she says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Most people do. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, and now I'd like to call up Paul Torville. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the Errol Heights community. My name is Paul Torville. Um, I've been a resident of Errol Heights since 2006 and, and have been invested in partnering with neighbors, civic groups since about then in efforts to make this neighborhood healthier, safer, and more connected since about then. Um, I fully support the formation of an LID to fund the described um, improvements in our neighborhood, along with many of my neighbors. And I've also been really pleased with the partnership and the level of involvement that we've had um, allowed through the many iterations of this project. It's not a one size fit all approach. Um, and the many groups, including PBOTs, parks, et cetera, have heard our voices throughout this project and incorporated that into the design and the real positive changes that will occur in our neighborhood in the near future. Um, there are many draws to this neighborhood when, when my family chose to put down roots here, the rural feel of this little pocket within the city and the proximity to Errol Heights Natural Park, but the trade-offs of the unincorporated or unimproved roads uh, are real and were quickly uh, apparent to us. Simple things like just opening your windows on a hot summer day became impossible because of the dust clouds from passing cars. There's safety issues from people that treat our roads like off-road motorcycle tracks at certain times of the year. Um, neighbors who are wheelchair bound 
are only able to pass from their homes to public transportation at times when the potholes aren't present. Um, so while there are some trade-offs to the improvements and the neighborhood will probably lose some of its, its uh, rural feel, the trade-offs are all positive in my view um, and will benefit all of us with safer, more equitable and accessible walking spaces, healthier air quality, better water quality in our surrounding rivers and streams like we've uh, been shown. And this will all be accomplished in a way that allows the neighborhood to hold on to its character and its identity by maintaining some of that rural natural charm with the less developed approach that's been taken with this project, the smaller streets, the slower traffic, uh, and the incorporation of the on-site water management. So lastly, um, the way that this is being financed is greatly appreciated. The partnership and the subsidized costs to those living here is what's really making this palatable to most of us. Like I said, I've been here since 2008 and I've seen the, the prior iterations of this project and the ability to defer payments on these improvements until our homes are sold are really what's making this possible and driving such a, a support for it. So thank you for the support, helping us make this happen. I really appreciate all the hard work from all the parties involved uh, and appreciate you hearing our voices. Thanks, Paul. It looks like there's a cheetah about to, to pounce on you there. Yes. <laughs> Her name is morning. Selby. <laughs> yes, everybody's bringing their cute little ones today, huh? Hi, <laughs> Selby. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. So um, shy, and not sure, but I hope you got a cutie with you there too. <laughs> <laughs> No, no pressure, Roshan. Um, so now I'd like to call up um, Roshan Bellavara. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. And thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I would bring them, except they're in Zoom classes right now. So they're, they're already predisposed well, in their class, which is better than not being in class, I guess. Um, I've been here since uh, 2008. And this project, as uh, Liz first said, started when my daughter was eight months old. So the running joke is, do we get a street first or does she go to college first? Um, you know, so that's kind of what it's become at this point. And this is the furthest the project has gotten. And I really appreciate um, Liz's team's work, George's team and their work, uh, the BES work that's gone into this. And like Paul said, the cost and the way the cost is being distributed right now makes it very palatable for everybody. Um, and the development of the park behind us is, you know, they try to keep the rustic and the uh, natural area as it is while doing the development that still will keep, as Paul said, the rural feel to the area, um, yet at the same time provide us with the basic infrastructure that every, uh, that we need. My kids, uh, you know, she's in sixth grade right now and she could not learn to ride her bike outside the street. We had to take her somewhere else. My neighbors, Molly's kids, uh, you know, none of them can ride their bikes on the street outside because there is no place for them to ride. And they have to share the street with cars that, like Molly said, swerve every which way to avoid a pothole. Um, these are, I mean, asking for a paved street, I think is something that we need as a neighborhood just to have our kids be able to play safely outside on sidewalks. Um, and I, I fully support the formation of this LID. And hopefully uh, we are at a point where we can finally bring this project to fruition and set a precedent as to how we can improve. The Errol Heights uh, project can be an example of how we can improve the entire Brentwood Darlington neighborhood area. Thank you all. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Roshan. Um, so that concludes our presentation. Um, we wanted to turn it back to council um, for any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, colleagues, are there any questions about the presentations that you've heard this morning? Uh, um, Commissioner Maps, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a question, but I do have a statement. I just want to express my appreciation to all the staff and the people who have helped make this really innovative project uh, come together. 
for those of you who are just tuning into this, you may not realize uh, how unique this is. This is in many ways a, a collaboration between three different bureaus, uh, transportation, environmental services, and parks. Uh, the impact it'll have on this particular community um, is really profound. It both will help uh, the quality of life above ground for neighbors like the ones we've just met. And as the um, commissioner in charge of environmental services, I can also uh, assure you it's gonna make a big difference below ground too. I'm deeply excited about our ability to um, uh, uh, to make some an environmental changes here that'll help keep uh, grease and oil and other pollutants out of uh, Johnson's Creek. And, um, and when you add on top of that, the fact that uh, I'm under Commissioner Rubio's leadership, we're going to have a new park going into this neighborhood. This is just a truly transformative project. Um, I'm proud to be part of it. And I just want to congratulate everyone who helped uh, make it happen. Uh, excellent work. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Oh, sorry, Mayor, do you want to take over facilitation? Yeah, yeah that's my job. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I really want to uh, compliment that presentation. It was so thorough. I especially enjoyed the testimony from the neighbors. And uh, Paul, when you were doing your testimony, um, I, I think you had a slip, but it was kind of well-founded. You, you started to say unincorporated. Well, I think that area wasn't incorporated to like around 86. And so I'm sure at times it still feels that way. And um, it's, you know, that, so these, um, these examples are everywhere. Um, and I've been out there and I, I agree with the, um, the uniqueness of the area. And so I'm not surprised all of you have hung in there um, because it's such a beautiful place to live. I do have a question about the funding model. And really, I think I'm asking for if a voter is watching this right now, um, I know that we passed um, a recent um, transportation bonds and much of the motivation to vote yes on that was to really look at issues like this to provide sidewalks and and I think um, some of our unincorporated neighborhoods that have been lagging with those investments. So I just want, want to hear that explained, um, the funding model. Um, I couldn't see it uh, in, the, in what you presented if, if money can come out of what the voters passed or if it's just a different setup. So if you could educate me and voters, that would be helpful. Absolutely, thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Um, so no, it's it's definitely sep separate from that measure. Um, we are using other other buckets of money um, uh, within transportation specifically. So we have um, our transportation system development charges um, on this project, um, and then some out of the mud. That's uh, program money. That was, that's what it was called when it was formed. Um, but money to help improve gravel streets throughout the city, um, and that. Um, uh, was originally funded by by general fund. So those are the two funding sources we have on this project. Thanks, okay. Commissioner Thank Ryan. Commissioner Rubio. Thanks uh, to everyone for bringing this presentation today. Um, and also, particularly, I want to uh, lift up exactly what Commissioner Mass also did. This uh, really great collaboration between BES, PBOT, and Parks. Um, so thank you all to the staff for your tireless work on this project over the years. Um, it's a, a wonderful example of this kind of collaboration and co-creation with the local community. And it really sets a really great standard for future projects. I um, also want to appreciate the Errol Heights community and Brentwood Darlington neighbors for your dedicated and sustained involvement, um, which seems obviously has spanned several years and seeing this issue through. Um, I'm really excited uh, to see this project move forward, um, and it's critical that we continue to make investments like these in underserved areas of our community, which there are many. Um, also looking forward to the uh, building of the sidewalks and the natural park, too. So congratulations to everyone. Very good. Thank you. And Commissioner Maps, you have your hand raised again, then Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, yeah, at this time I actually do have a question. This is such an interesting um, approach to uh, bringing about infrastructure uh, to a neglected neighborhood. You know, we have roads, we have sewer systems, and we have parks. Um, I'm wondering if we've learned anything here that could be brought to other neighborhoods. Um, in other words, is this a strategy that we could use to get uh, um, uh, to pave some roads and to provide better infrastructure to other communities in Portland that are still dealing with the gravel roads that we all grew up with. 
Um, absolutely. This is Liz Chilstrom, Pivot. Um, yeah, Commissioner Maps, that is that is our intent with, with this pilot project. Um, and so taking the lessons learned from Errol um, and starting to, to um, get at the rest of the 40 plus miles of gravel streets we, we have throughout the city, um, we have some projects that are queued up over the next few years to do just that. Um, and using the money, since we no longer issue waivers to developers, um, the city now collects fees through the, the LTIC um, program. And so using the, the funding and, and money that's being collected there um, and taking the lessons um, model from this project um, and, and um, working on other gravel streets, uh, street projects moving forward. So, yeah. Uh, that's great. I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. And I'm sure every Portlander who still uh, is living on a gravel road will be relieved to hear that there is uh, help on the way. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Hurst. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you all. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to be here, especially uh, the Earl uh, 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 Flynn neighbors uh, for being here this morning. Uh, one thing occurred to me um, as someone who's been a long time a supporter of the Brentwood Darlington uh, Neighborhood Association and know how hard they work to actually uh, build uh, um, a community uh, in a place where it lacks significant public investment. I just have to say how proud I am that uh, city bureaus and Brentwood Darlington neighborhood and business community um, in that community could all come together um, around this effort. Um, I, I wanna caution because it takes a long time as we've heard today uh, for these kind of projects to move forward. And I don't want us to leave this uh, conversation thinking that this is gonna be an easy fix for the uh, thousands of road projects that we need to uh, build in this city. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the outcome of this pilot project and what we learn and how we take that learning into other work as we move forward. So again, I just wanna thank everybody uh, for their um, goodwill uh, and for sticking with it because again, great ideas at the city don't happen overnight. Uh, it takes a lot of work from a lot of people and it's fabulous to see our bureaus working so cooperatively uh, on a community concern. Uh, and yes, I have uh, walked around Brentwood Darlington area uh, in the rain and it is always a very frightening experience because you never know what, how big the pothole will be. Uh, so thank you again, appreciate it, everybody. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Ryan, do you have your hand raised again? No, it's uh, my bad habit of taking it down. Not, not a problem at all. Uh, and it looks like everybody's got their initial questions answered here. Keelan, do we have any public testimony for either item 65 or 66? Yes, we have three people who have joined the meeting to testify. Perfect, thank you. Three minutes each, name for the record. First up, we have Zach Katz. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you see me or just hear me? We can hear you, but we uh, can't see you. Okay, that's fine. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I just wanna say that I really support this project and um, I'm really glad that you're making this neighborhood um, better for walking, uh, better for biking and safer for driving as well, um, better for all modes. And um, I kind of wanna tie it back to a project that um, is coming up this summer on Hawthorne Boulevard, um, which I've sort of devoted uh, my heart and soul to over the past year. Um, they're repaving the street and repainting it, as you might know. Um, and it's an opportunity to uh, transform the street into one that serves the community and um, the neighborhood for the 21st century um, in the same way that the Arrow Heights project does, um, making it safer for people to walk, for people to bike. Um, and uh, because Hawthorne is a commercial district, um, improving uh, the business prospects um, for local businesses, um, especially to assist with COVID recovery. Um, and so I just hope that um, um, everyone here, I guess, recognizes, um, appreciates the importance of um, the alternative with protected bike lanes. 
um, and two and one driving lane in each direction. I don't want to get too wonky here, but um, this is super important for um, for safety. Uh, first and foremost, um, as you know, a, a, sm a small girl was killed uh, four years ago at the currently dangerous land configuration east of Chavez. Um, and um, also, um, like I mentioned, COVID recovery, um, protected bike lanes are extremely good for small businesses by bringing an entirely new stream of foot traffic and cycling traffic, increasing visibility, um, and have been proven to uh, contribute sales to local businesses and improve local economies in cities all across the country and the world. Um, and um, I don't know how much time I have left. I, I had a lot to talk about, but uh, I hope that for, for those reasons and um, and also for, for just equity purposes, climate purposes, um, this is a really important project. And um, I hope that um, we recognize um, the how crucial it is to get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. Next up, we have Emily Rowland. Hi, um, I am happy to be here. I am a resident um, in the corner of Stark and 41st. And actually, Zach was the one that informed me that I could uh, do some public testimony. But uh, yeah, I also just wanted to tack on to what Zach has already stated. Um, and I hope I'm commenting here on the right issues, but you know, in, in the same node of public safety, it seems like that's been a real theme uh, in today's meeting on a bunch of different fronts. Um, being in Portland for the past year and a half, formerly a resident of Burlington, Vermont, I haven't felt the most safe on these streets, um, which is unfortunate. <laughs> and I, I think that's attributed to a couple different things that I just wanted to mention. I mean, I work on Hawthorne, so this potential project from PBOT is of particular interest to me. Uh, I use Hawthorne as, you know, kind of my, my gateway to go get my groceries, to get to work, um, the post office. So I, you know, I come from a place and uh, yeah, I, I'm just really wanting to prioritize the safety of, of biking and transportation on foot for a number of reasons, obviously. Uh, one, to address climate change. I think that's huge. I think if PBOT really wants to stand behind, um, you know, the claim that it wants to make changes for environmental reasons, then we need to have a serious conversation about how public infrastructure should incorporate more biking and walking. Um, and if parking is the issue, which it seems like it is in a lot of cases, uh, you know, there's a lot of pushback from residents about not having street parking. Well, I think that could be addressed. It feels like kind of a moot point if we can figure out a way to have better parking infrastructure um, that kind of diverts people from having to park on the street of Hawthorne. And again, I mean, I've worked in Burlington on getting uh, bike lanes on, on streets that are heavily traveled by cars uh, and parking was always kind of an issue. <laughs> so if that is going to be kind of a theme here, I think a pilot program that just addresses that by having bike lanes, um, you know, a turning lane in the middle and uh, kind of incorporating bus lanes as well. I think that just increases the safety um, versus me having to, and not just me, I know other folks too who rely on their bikes to go onto these side streets um, that often have kind of confusing layouts with stop signs here and folks who don't know how to drive on those streets uh, tend to you know, kind of blow through the stop signs. I've had a couple of scary encounters. So anyway, um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to, you know, throw my support behind this, this potential uh, bike lane project on Hawthorne and just continue to be an advocate for safer streets for bikers and walkers um, in addressing climate change as well. So anyway, kind of rambling, but <laughs> I appreciate the space to be here and I thank you for, for hearing my concerns. Thank you, appreciate it. Next up we have- uh, If I may, Mayor. Please, Commissioner Hurstie. Uh Thank you. I think the other two people are testifying on an item that is not in front of us today. 
uh, we will be hearing about a plan around Hawthorne maintenance project. Uh, so I, I, I'm just uh, confused about whether or not people thought they were signing up for public comment where they can talk about anything or that people are just premature and testifying about the Hawthorne maintenance project. Elin, how many more people have signed up? Uh, we have one more person for this item. And could, could we inquire whether that individual would like to testify on the local improvement district formation or whether they're here for some other purpose? Sure. Uh, it's Xavier Stickler is the next person. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I, uh, I am here to testify on the Arrow Heights Improvement District. Perfect. Go for it. All right. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Good, mo good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Mayor uh, and members of the council. My name is Xavier D. Stickler. I'm a student of architecture with a focus on urban design here in Portland. Uh, I'm testifying in favor of the Arrow Heights Improvement District. Um, as proposed, uh, the improvement district would bring much needed side street and pedestrian infrastructure to far southeast Portland, an area long underserved by public capital investment and services. It is essential, uh, in my opinion, that all of Portland begin to have access to basic resources and public amenities, especially in this moment of uh, racial consciousness and cognizance. Uh, one of the things that is in the current ethos of education is how do we tackle large problems at, at, with small solutions? Um, that's the easiest way uh, to a large degree. Uh, we're only going to meet our climate goals if we start making uh, wide sweeping transitions um, to how our economy and transportation system works. Um, obviously, uh, big changes are hard to do and take quite a lot of time. As you've seen on this project, even small changes can uh, drag out over the course of years. And of course, uh, we suffered a major de uh, defeat in the transportation advocacy community this last November with the defeat of the Metro bond and TriMet's um, lukewarm plans, shall we say, on how to respond to that. Uh, however, even with small uh, changes like this, you can see ma major improvements. Um, Portland's east side is uh, comprised of large swaths of gravel roads that are hostile to pedestrians and people with disabilities who are going to be disproportionately transit dependent and disproportionately more likely to live in these uh, uh, lower cost of living areas. Um, if we want to see more support for transit, a great way to do that is simply by putting in uh, the infrastructure that will help people get to buses, get to schools safely. Um, if we want to see increased morale and increased public support for the types of changes we're going to need to make uh, that will be transformative to how our city functions, we need to start with these small solutions and echoing off what Commissioner Hardestay said, I think this is a great pilot project. Um, this will be a great opportunity to see what works, what doesn't, and see how to copy and paste that and tailor it for each neighborhood moving forward, uh, and hopefully even come out with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, even less expensive outcomes. Um, so thank you to Commissioner Hardestay. Thank you to all the work for PBOT, and uh, thank you for letting me speak today. I very much appreciate it. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Very good. Colleagues, any further questions on either of these items before we call the roll? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll on item 65, the resolution. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Hardesty? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The resolution is adopted to the emergency ordinance item 66. Please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Hardesty? Good job, everyone. Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thank you, everybody. Great presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Next up is the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled from the consent agenda? 
We've had no requests. Please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Hardesty? I'm sorry, aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye, the consent agenda is adopted. To the regular agenda then, item number 74, please. Approve revised settlement agreement in the matter of City of Portland v. Monsanto et al. and authorize the process for use of settlement funds. Colleagues, today Commissioner Maps and I are co-sponsoring an ordinance that follows an action we took last summer to settle the city's suit against Monsanto. The City of Portland joined many other local governments across the nation in holding Monsanto accountable for decades of pollution. Monsanto manufactured the chemical PCB from the 1930s to the 1970s, which polluted the Willamette River and many other bodies of water throughout the United States. This ordinance would approve the city's revised settlement agreement with Monsanto. The administrative revisions accommodate the federal judge's request for changes and provide more clarity on where the settlement funds will go once the city receives them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Maps for introductory remarks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, colleagues, I would just like to add that I'm incredibly excited about um, this particular project. It will both uh, further the cause of environmental protection and further the cause of environmental justice. Um, ultimately, these funds will be uh, administered by the city's Brandfield program, which lives in the Bureau of Environmental Services. Um, as the Commissioner of Environmental Services, I'm delighted to announce that these funds will uh, be used to help uh, clean up pollution here in Portland, especially in low income neighborhoods and in communities of color. I'm here today to tell us more about this program. We have Nancy Klinger, the city's senior deputy attorney, and Annie Von Berg with the Bureau of Environmental Services. Um, Ms. Klinger, welcome and please uh, tell us more about this program. Thank you, Commissioner, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, councilors, mayor, and all of those who are in attendance today. I'm Nancy Klinger, the senior deputy attorney. I work on environmental matters for the city. And what I'll do is give you, try to keep this brief, a short history of the case. Some of you have heard this, but others have not. So it will sound familiar to some. Um, describe why and how the settlement agreement was revised and then finished with today's ordinance. So the history of the case was back in 2016, city council authorized the city attorney's office to um, pursue Monsanto company for um, under various tort claim theories and mostly around the idea of public nuisance. Monsanto was the only company that produced uh, the toxic chemical PCBs between the 30s and until 1979 when they were banned. So if there were PCBs out there, they were pretty much Monsanto's. Um, we did this with an outside counsel on a contingency basis. And um, after 2016, it proceeded through discovery, a trial date was set, there was extensive motion practice. And also during that time, several other cities, counties and port districts across the country joined and also had, they didn't join our litigation, they also filed suit against Monsanto. Um, and those cases also were progressing towards trial, trial was set, but, but no trials had happened yet. And I think that prompted the settlement discussions and those discussions led to um, the proposed settlement that came before council in July. And it takes these 13 individual city states that had filed cases and puts them together as a class action suit that covers all um, cities, counties, port jurisdictions across the country who have permits to discharge um, under the Clean Water Act into water bodies that are impacted by PCBs and thus they have a lot of expenses um, because of the increased monitoring and steps that they have to take because of PCBs getting there. The settlement um, was approved by the city and the other named plaintiffs in the litigation. It went to the California District Court for acceptance of the uh, class. 
and the class action and also for the proposed settlement. The judge denied that motion and had some very specific issues that the judge wanted clarification on. Um, these were not big changes in the settlement as much as it was confirming some things that the judge wanted to make kind of kind of darn sure that this is what was happening. And one of them is that the attorney fees were going to be paid by Monsanto directly. They were not going to be coming out of the settlement fund itself. That's not a change, but it's being it's worded more directly now in the settlement. Also was confirming the scope of the release that all of these cities and countings and, and Portland is providing and that it really is narrowly tailored to the claims that were brought in the case. Um, the previous version was, uh, shall we say, verbose. <laughs> it kind of went on and on, and now it's trimmed down to um, a narrow release as it should be appropriate. And address some other issues raised by attorney generals in, in other parts of the country that were not relevant to Oregon. So the reside settlement addresses these issues, and in the course of doing it, it made one other change that will be helpful for the city. And that is um, originally the distribution of funds was going to be done over the course of four years. Now the settlement, um, once the funds are distributed, it will be distributed over uh, a single payment. So what the settlement means to the city remains the same as it was before in, in July. Monsanto will put $550 million into an escrow account for payment to the class members. The funds will be distributed um, based on different formula that take into account kind of the different level of damages that different cities and ports have. Um, someplace like the city of Portland has uh, more damages because we have um, had to do quite a bit of work in the Columbia Slough Slu based on the, the DMDL there. There's been issues related in the Willamette River that have to do with PCBs as well. We also have incurred costs because we were an original plaintiff, although it was done on a contingency basis, the city still does have some costs. And so um, the, the formula kind of tries to be more equitable in how the funds are delivered to the cities and states, all of the 2,500 uh, class members who remain in the class will get um, a certain amount for sampling and investigation of PCBs. And that final apportionment will be done by a special master who is appointed by the court. In exchange, all of these class members are releasing Monsanto from claims regarding Monsanto's distribution and manufacture of PCBs. It's not releasing them from Superfund claims or any specific cleanup claim. Um, those are explicitly cut out of the settlement. It doesn't release any of the third parties who have used PCB products and um, may have improperly disposed of them or released them into the environment. It's, it's not that. It's about the, the, the nuisance and the damages done to holders of Clean Water Act permits. It's about Monsanto as the manufacturer of the product that caused those damages. So the next step in the court process is that um, it, council approves the revised settlement. The city would become one of the named class action um, plaintiffs in, in the national class action. It goes back to the US District Court for the Central District of California. Um, and the California district hopefully will approve the settlement this time. And if approved, um, the city's case in the local court would be dismissed. Um, the city will provide the documentation to the special master showing our damages. And then the special master will review all applications and then the money will be distributed to the various cities, counties, and ports. So we won't know the total amount of funds that the city receives until all of those steps happen. The settlement has to be accepted, the applications received, the special master um, comes up with a distribution plan, and the court approves that plan. Um, that said, we are expected to go through those steps within the year. Um, and as in the previous settlement, it does not require or direct that the funds are used in any particular way um, once they are received by the recipient. And so the ordinance before you 
approves this proposed revised settlement. Um, it does not authorize the expenditure of the settlement funds received because that process has not been determined yet. Um, the July, July ordinance uh, stated council's expectations that the funds be focused in communities that have been disproportionately impacted by environmental contamination, which is most often disproportionately the black, indigenous, people of color, immigrant, and refugee communities. And the process for determining the uses of the funds must be co-created with the impacted community. The July ordinance tasked BES with co-creating that process and returning to council for approval and use of the funds. The ordinance does not touch any of those findings. It does not specify how the funds will be used. It will depend on the outcome of the public process. The today's ordinance does specify that the Portland Brownfield program within BES will be taking on the ministerial functions of facilitating that public process. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Annie. Although actually before I do that, um, I, I would like as a final note to extend a thank you to my co-counsel on this complex and challenging matter. Um, Monsanto is not an easy party to work with on the other side of the table. Uh, Scott Modi and Karen Moynihan did a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, Jan Betts, who was retired from the city as well. And there was there were there were many long and difficult meetings and welcome guidance from our former city attorney, Tracy Reeve. But I'd like to turn it over to Annie Bomberg and Jen Bildersee from BES, um, who can uh, discuss the process for developing the um, co-creating the process for use of the settlement funds. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Annie Bomberg. I'm the Environmental Remediation Manager for BES. As Nancy said, the purpose of today's council action will be to provide authority for the city to enter into the settlement and ultimately, hopefully, collect those funds and establish a landing spot for those funds once we do collect those. The direction you provided us last summer that the funds be focused on BIPOC communities that have been disproportionately impacted by environmental contamination has not changed. And, uh, and in fact has been stronger reinforced by its placement within our Brownsfields program. The city's Brownfield program is the only program at the city that was created and is currently charged with advancing environmental justice by addressing environmental contamination. So they're uniquely qualified to shepherd this uh, process for us. Um, it, besides the direction um, that council has given us to focus these on most impacted communities, uh, there is no limitation that's been placed on these funds, which means they don't necessarily have to be spent on Brownfields projects. Since it's still uncertain whether this settlement will be approved through the federal court, we have not started any process on how to spend these funds yet, and we do not anticipate on starting that until we get a little more finalization of what, whether that settlement is approved. We want to make sure we're very thoughtful in co-creating this plan from the very beginning with our community partners. Um, so once we know more, we'll be reaching out and starting that process. Uh, and I'd like to extend an invite for any of the commissioner offices that are interested in participating. We would love to have you involved if you'd like. So uh, with that, I'd like to open it up. Uh, I think that's the completion of our presentation and we're here to answer questions if you have them. Awesome, colleagues. Any questions at this particular juncture? Seeing none, good, thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, sorry, Mayor, excuse oh, yep. me. One you more bet. question, and um, it's maybe is more of a BES question about kind of what will the process be to engage community members? Because uh, as you know, there's been a significant development and I'm just kind of curious if there's been any thought to what that looks like. And if not, I'm fine to wait until that happens. Yeah, right now there hasn't been any thought. We've waited, uh, we just, we didn't want to use anybody's time up on something that maybe we didn't even know would happen. So we've been kind of holding back, waiting till we get a little more certainty. And then we're hoping to really uh, create a process from a clean slate with our community uh, partners that we know that were very engaged in environmental contamination issues up to this point and others that have been disproportionately impacted as a result of PCBs. So we look forward to starting uh, from the very, very beginning with the community on this and what that looks like. 
Well, I just want you to know that uh, 30 plus years ago when I came to Portland, it was the very first issue that I became an activist around with the Environmental Justice Action Group led by Jerry Sandoval at that time. So I go way back on this issue. And I want to say to both of you, thank you so much. Excellent legal representation, excellent leadership for us to be the ones actually uh, drawing the line in the sand early. Uh, and glad to see that we have partners across the country who will also benefit uh, from the work that we did. So I greatly appreciate the work that got us to this place. And I certainly understand why the need for modification. Very good, thank you. Uh, colleagues, any other questions before we call for public testimony? Keelan, do we have anybody signed up for public testimony on this item? Yes, we have four people signed up. First up is Michael Pouncil. Welcome. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, all right, all right. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity today, uh, Commissioner uh, and Mayor, uh, and thank you for that recognition of those um, that we lost in the Rose City. Uh, so many are so close in degrees of separation to us. So I want to thank you for, for that acknowledgement. Um, my name is Michael Pouncil and I chair Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group. Um, there's been a history in Portland of uh, the reallocation of funds away from poor communities and, to, uh, and communities of color uh, and to pockets of developers to develop um, extremely affluent areas that are overwhelmingly white and, uh, and or affluent uh, populations. Um, there's also been uh, promises to clean up communities in North and Northeast Portland and provide adequate amount of affordable housing. But instead we got these you know, high rises, these luxury high rises that were built on remediated South waterfront lands for Portland's most affluent. Um, the BIPOC communities have had a lot to deal with. Um, you know, uh, there's been a history of uh, man-made pandemics like uh, rampant evictions, foreclosures of black owned homes, intentional uh, con contributions to white influx and to historic black communities and increased segregation within regional communities. Um, it's common knowledge that it takes resources to talk to lawyers, designers, and unfortunately it takes uh, time, lots of time to talk with uh, policymakers, working middle class income um, uh, and poor and working intergenerational families do not have the time nor the money or the extra energy required to ser seriously pursue their own communities community's interests um, at these times. Um, so I'm here to say uh, that, um, that uh, these funds should be used with the lens of recognition and responsibility of environmental injustice within BES Brownfields program in a meaningful way through oral histories, apologies, and educations to convey meaningful recognition. Also, there should be meaningful community-based reparations with these funds, and the funds should be a beginning to a healing process, not the end, and the funds should be used as a shifting of power paradigms for working class people who do not have the time, the money, the energy to, inf to influence or be heard because of the existing power dynamics of time, money, and access. Within BES Brownfields program, there has to be serious discussion about possible negative impacts of brownfield remediation uh, within BIPOC communities. Um, coming into BIPOC communities and repairing brownfields in poor communities for the benefit of outside affluent developers is an inadequate solution and it serves nothing for BIPOC communities and does not serve justice in our community. Once again, BES Brownfields program must use a lens of restorative justice and, re and reparations uh, with the Monsanto settlement and bicarb communities. Uh, thank you so much for your time today and thanks for broaching this. Thank you. Next up, we have Elijah Cetus. Welcome. Uh, greetings, Council. Uh, my name is Elijah Cetus. I organize with Portland Harbor Community Coalition um, and I, I grew up in North Portland. I want to echo uh, my colleagues' comments about um, 
just in to give thanks for advancing this work and, and also for your words this morning about gun violence in Portland. Um, so one of the tenets of the environmental justice movement is the polluter pays. This acknowledges that in the making of profit through environmental harm, a debt is generated to the people who live, work, and pray in that space, and that the work of restoring justice starts with ascribing a value to that harm and paying reparations so the wealth is fairly redistributed. The late Commissioner Fish understood this principle and began this Monsanto lawsuit after community identified the opportunity and brought it to him. This is why we're here and his spirit animates this discussion. So thank you, Commissioner Maps, Mayor Wheeler, and especially the staff for continuing this work. Um, another environmental justice tenant is just as important, however, and that is nothing about us without us. The phrase comes from disability activists in South Africa who under apartheid fought not only to end their suffering, but for the inherent right to speak on their own behalf and decide how benefits would be distributed. North Portlanders harmed by decades of pollution, environmental racism, and dispossession in the Portland Harbor hold these same rights to self-determination and to decide how this Monsanto settlement should be restituted. It's imperative for council to set up a meaningful collaborative process for the people most impacted to be at the table. While we're glad for the commitments you've made in the July ordinance, it is not acceptable for community to be given little more than a week's notice to prepare um, for meetings such as the one occurring today, we, we need dialogue up front early and often. I'm a paid organizer, so it's my job to be here at short notice, but I'm not the person you need to reach. Uh, you need to build trust and hold accountability to the elders, tribal members, fishers, people who live by the river, housed and unhoused, and who have faced the harm. 10 miles of PCB pollution has intersected with the lives of real human beings and they are owed a collaborative process. Otherwise, we, we do know that it will be all too easy for those who have already benefited in the harbor, developers, wealthy businesses, and polluters to use these funds and profit from cleanup and upzoning, commercialization, and gentrification. The Portland Harbor is at a crossroads and we need you to take the community side intentionally. So make a real process for impacted people to speak on their own behalf and decide how the money they are owed will be used. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Cassie Cohen. Good morning, Mayor and Council members. My name is Cassie Cohen. I'm the Executive Director of Portland Harbor Community Coalition. Uh, our mission is to elevate the voices of communities disproportionately impacted by the pollution of the Portland Harbor Superfund site, which is in the R Willamette River, to ensure an, uh, an equitable cleanup uh, process and also uh, to secure community benefits in the cleanup and redevelopment processes. Um, I, uh, since Commissioner Hardesty mentioned this, I, I also wanted to uh, honor the work of, um, of her and Jerry Jimenez and so many others who've been fighting to clean the river for decades. Um, it, is, uh, it is an exciting prospect to have settlement funds coming to this city and its residents from one of the most egregious international polluters uh, uh, and corporations today, Monsanto, that remains liable um, along with 150 parties to clean up the Willamette River Superfund site. Um, in talking with the Brownfields and Superfund staff um, here at the city over the last several days, I am more encouraged. But I, um, you know, I, I'm also one that has the privilege of having easy access to staff, and so many others don't. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to hear uh, about the city's plans to co-create a process with community members for the funds to serve, especially. Uh, BIPOC communities and others that are impacted. However, let this be a reflective moment too. Uh, a handful of leaders learned late last week that an ordinance passed in July and plans for, for this current ordinance uh, was up for a vote today regarding this Monsanto settlement. Lack of early communication and consistent updates about the settlement and what the city means by co-creation um, led to an unnecessary exacerbation of community concerns, fears, mistrust, and unanswered questions. 
These factors make it harder for community leaders to trust a co-creation process is coming, not already decided or legally restricted. The city must begin to systematically overhaul the cycle of public involvement driven by urgency and decisions driven by risk aversion. The next settlement or the next project plan, let's all start months er earlier. Let's be in dialogue many months before any report to council or decision is made, even if there is uncertainty. Let's be sure bureaus are generously applying the city of Portland public involvement principles adopted in 2010. I invite the city to assess early whether you have the right representatives of community members historically harmed by PCBs in the river and fish to jointly launch this co-creation process. Let's bring back a focus on Monsanto, Monsanto's PC cost on human health and wildlife. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and finally, we have Barbara Quinn. Welcome, Barbara. Barbara, are you muted? Keelan, what can you tell me? Uh, it looks like Barbara might still be muted. Barbara, are you able to unmute? Looks like she's calling in. Um, I believe she is connected by by internet. Um, Barbara, if you're on the phone, if you try star six, that would unmute your phone. Yeah, it looks like she may be having trouble unmuting. Okay, can she... Um... Huh. Can she provide written testimony? Absolutely. Uh, she can submit that to CC testimony at- Can you hear me now? Um, oh, <laughs> yes. Good. We can hear you I'm now. I'm so Barbara. sorry. No so worries. Sorry. Um, I, had a, I had a glitch. Um, we, we all have had those, so welcome. We're glad <laughs> we have you connected. Yes. Uh, my name is Barbara Quinn. Thank you so much for um, allowing me this opportunity to speak. Um, I have understood, first of all, I'd like to say that I agree with everything that uh, the previous testifier said, but I would like to um, ask a question about the ordinance. And also, um, I have been told by various representatives of BES that the funds are not necessarily going to be used at the Portland Harbor. They can be used in any way. And uh, this is a little bit uh, problematic for for me because it was originally several of us from the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group that went to Nick Fish and talked to him about the possibility of joining this um, action class action. So that's that's a little problematic. Seems ironic that then the funds may not be used on what is probably the most significant BCB site, um, certainly in Portland and possibly in the state. Um, the question I have is this concerning the ordinance. It says that the city can apply for the funds as a sediment site, specifically Portland Harbor sediment site. Um, and I'm wondering if that's what we're going to do. And if we're going to do that, then it makes ultimate sense to a lot of us activists that those funds would be used on the most significant site we have, which is the Portland Harbor. Certainly there must be a way to hold the potentially responsible party parties liable while at the same time using those funds where they're needed most. Um, I feel that the North Portland and Northwest and Northeast Portland community have been um, most affected by this site because in spite of what anyone uh, in the agencies may tell you, those uh, smaller molecules of PCBs can go airborne and they can go airborne within about a five mile radius, according to Dr. 
David Carpenter of the University at New York in Albany. And he has about 450 uh, peer reviewed publications. So he, he is informed and uh, he's a scientist, Harvard educated. And I think that we have to take that seriously. I think that people in this neighborhood have been adversely affected by, by this pollution. And this is a site that needs to be addressed and those funds should be used where they're needed most. And they're needed most in my opinion and others opinion here in this 10 mile stretch. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I don't know whether Annie or Jen can answer that question on the fly that you posed. I think this is probably best for Nancy to address, but it is important to note that the, the damages as a result of this claim aren't specific just to Portland Harbor. These are waterways within the Portland area. So it, this is much broader than just the Portland Harbor Superfund. Well, it's not. Mm -mm. No. I, I can provide some clarification on how the city will apply for funds if the proposed settlement is approved. Yeah, that'd be is, helpful. Yeah, there, um, the, the settlement has um, a rather complicated setup to try to apportion the funds um, in a way that addresses public nuisance issues from PCB's presence in stormwater. And so there are kind of four separate funds out there, one um, sub funds that you apply to, to kind of help distribute these funds. One are sampling and investigation to every entity uh, across the nation that holds an MS4 permit. One is for legal fees. One is for areas where um, a storm water discharge is into a water body that has a EPA enforced PCB um, TMDL, I don't want to get too technical, but, but has uh, particular limitations on it. And those who have actually um, incurred costs for federal Superfund site cleanups. And the, this is a way to distribute the funds. There is no part of the settlement agreement that is mandating how the funds will be used. It is a way to distribute this, this large pot of money. Thank you, appreciate it. Very good. Colleagues, any further questions on this item? Do you need a motion, Mayor? Uh, this is actually a uh, ordinance, so I don't need a motion. Just okay. we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and call the roll, please. Rubio? Uh, I want to say thank you to Mayor Wheeler and Commissioner Maps for bringing this forward today. And also, I really appreciate the community that's testified today. Um, and I appreciate hearing their thoughtful recommendations about this and the lenses that we should be using and how we also need to authentically engage community. Um, I believe it's, it's critical that we center and uplift voices of frontline and impacted communities. So I'm very happy to hear um, that these are the communities that will benefit from this settlement. Um, and as such, I also agree 100% that communities should be directly involved in shaping how we spend these fund dollars in the community. And I would be very eager to hear more about this as we get closer. So I, for one, would like my office to be involved per Annie's invitation to do so. Um, so thank you to BES staff and to city attorneys um, uh, for moving this to the next uh, phase. And I look forward uh, with all of you and with my fellow commissioners to ensure this happens. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Commissioner Maps, for bringing this to the diocese. Um, I thought the presentation was really, it was kind of dense at times, but it was very, um, <laughs> it was very, um, it was very, let's see, insightful. I thought the testimony raised did, did um, bring up some great questions. And I trust that Commissioner Maps and the team at BES will take those into consideration. I know it's not exactly the same thing, but we have a lot of legwork going on with the Portland Ch Clean Energy Fund. And I hope that the intelligence that we're gathering, the deep rooted community work that we're doing there, um, that we cash in on that, uh, that work, if you will. Um, so I just hope the dots are connecting 
um, with that work that's going on. And I'm sure that Commissioner Hardesty and others are, are already on top of that. It's just my chance to weigh in on this. And as somebody who grew up in North Portland and even know where the Columbia, Columbia Slough is, I sometimes wonder why I'm still alive at times. Um, I, I have some attachment to um, this issue. And um, I, I did hear what you had to say that it spreads beyond that local area, but that's still um, a lot of a lot of rights need to be, a lot of wrongs need to be right in there. And I appreciate some of the testimony that spoke to that. Anyway, I look forward to the updates on this and I think that it's moving in the right direction and I vote aye, thanks. Artisty. Um, I really appreciate the very thoughtful presentation. I appreciate the legal guidance that has actually got us to this place. Um, and I really am especially appreciative of Michael and Cassie's uh, presentation because it really actually focused on and how is this going to benefit frontline communities, those who have most often uh, bared the brunt with poor air quality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I am very happy to hear that we have not made decisions about how these dollars will be invested or in what part of the city. I would say that every single part of the city uh, needs investments and has uh, uh, environmental uh, challenges and environmental justice issues. Uh, I live in East Portland and we could talk about environmental injustice in my community. So I look forward to the very intentional process that Commissioner Maps and his team will use as we start having those conversations proactively long before we know how much money we have, long before the money hits the bank, because as you know, it's a much more difficult conversation once we have the dollars in hand. And if we can start uh, working with communities today, uh, I think that we will end up with uh, some real investments that will benefit BIPOC communities for generations. And I want to piggyback on something Commissioner Ryan said, which is uh, if we're not looking for opportunities to actually get a better bang for our buck with the Portland Clean Energy Fund and where we're moving uh, based on our climate action plan, then once again, we will miss an opportunity to truly be turning the ship in a way that I'm sorry, ex-Navy, got to use the ship metaphor, um, <laughs> to be turning the ship in a way that is actually going to be intentionally beneficial for BIPOC community members. And so I'm very happy to vote aye. And I also would like my office to be involved and let us know how we can best support your efforts to make this the most inclusive, engaged, intentional process that the city of Portland has participated in. I vote aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. I want to thank everybody in the community who's been working on this for years. And I want to appreciate the testimony that we heard today. And I absolutely agree with everything my colleagues just said with regard to making sure that those who are disproportionately impacted by these issues initially are equally disproportionately included in the solutions and the distribution of the benefits of this settlement agreement. I wanna thank you, uh, Nancy and, and Annie and Jen for an excellent presentation. And I know it, it, it probably seems almost anticlimactic given the amount of work that you've all put into this and I appreciate it very much. And I, I wanna thank the uh, resident who testified who raised Commissioner Fish because this really was the work of Commissioner Fish that got this rolling on behalf of the council by taking into account and understanding the importance of what the community was bringing to our attention. And I wanna link that all the way to the other side, to the testimony we heard, as well as my colleagues' comments around the opportunity ahead and the ability to not only start to right some of the previous wrongs, but also leverage the new opportunities we have as a council around our aggressive climate action goals, some of the tools that we have in our toolkit, including the Portland Clean Energy Fund and other resources, and the opportunity to engage with and build trust with the community that's looking to us for leadership around air quality, water quality, addressing climate change, and making sure that we're protecting our immediate environment. So this, this has the feel of a great opportunity Commissioner Maps, we're putting all of this burden squarely 
on your shoulders, but now that you've been here for 34 days, uh, we know that you're completely up to the challenge and all of us look forward to working with you and supporting you and uh, your staff as well as the bureaus in these efforts. So don't don't think we're sending you out alone. We, we all have something at stake here and uh, I'm just personally very appreciative for your, your leadership on this. I'm very happy to vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next up, we have uh, several second readings. The first one is item 75. Authorize a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Columbia Boulevard wastewater treatment plant outfall diffuser and improvements project number E06923 for an estimated amount of $5,500,000. Colleagues, we've already heard very interesting presentations on this matter, as well as the opportunity for public testimony. This is a second reading. Is there any further discussion? Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. I look forward to working with Commissioner Mapp as we make sure that our entire community benefits from the real opportunities that all of the proposals that uh, we're going to be voting on today provide. I vote aye. Maps. Um, I want to re reassure my colleagues that we will be looking at how we can uh, diversify this work. Uh, um, so, and anyone else who has uh, concerns about the contracting pieces of this, our doors and and uh, phone numbers are open. Um, I'm excited about this really interesting project that we have before us. For those of you uh, uh, who are trying to tune in and remember which one this is, this is the pipe, or these are the pipes that release clean uh, water into the Columbia. Uh, um, it's a really interesting and technically challenging project. Uh, um, and um, I'm proud to vote aye. Wheeler. Aye, right. the ordinance is adopted. Item 76, also a second reading. Authorize a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Stark and Buckman East Reconstruction and Green Street Project number E10216 for an estimated cost of $23,837,000. Colleagues, also a second reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. I just want to say thank you for the presentation last week. And community engagement and language access are both obviously very important priorities to me and I also I know to the rest of, of council. Um, and so I want to thank uh, Debbie Castleton for leading the public involvement on this project. I vote aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Hi, right, the ordinance is adopted. Item 77, also a second reading. Authorize a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Columbia Boulevard Wastewater Treatment Plant Headworks Screening Improvements Project number E10805 for an estimated amount of $12 million. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll, Keelan. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Last item 78, second reading. Authorize a competitive solicitation and contract with the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and provide payment for construction of the Ankeny pump station odor treatment. System Rehab Project number E11093 for an estimated amount of $1,200,000. Any further discussion on this second reading? Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. This uh, project is important for multiple reasons, so um, and including improving working conditions for employees. I'm so happy to support this. I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I will never forget that presentation as long as I live. It was uh, very thorough and well done, and I vote aye. Hardesty? Aye. Maps? Aye. Mueller? Aye. The ordinance is adopted, and that uh, completes our business for this morning. We are adjourned until 2 p.m.
We'll see you all later.